أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين صدق الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uncle Imam Rashid and the uncle always comes first members of the Claremont Main Road Mosque community and family thank you very much for this opportunity to address you this Friday and provide some nasiha as has been customary over this time of isolation and lockdown since early 2020 now. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Cizu Mbofu Walsh. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Witz and have just published this new book, The New Apartheid, which Alhamdulillah I'm glad to say is currently one of the best-selling books in South Africa at the moment. And in this talk, I'll be reflecting on the work talking about the contribution that I hope that it makes and it gives me great pleasure to do so before this community because this is always something of a homecoming. This was my first mosque and was the place that I was married and so this institution means a great deal to me and I think this institution is a rare island of constructive discourse, of community and of togetherness in a society that is increasingly fractured. And so I wish all of you well, and I thank you for your time and attention as this talk unfolds. So I'd like to begin with an epigraph or a quotation that opens this book, The New Apartheid. And this, I think, will introduce you to the idea in this work and I'll expand on it as this talk unfolds. But this work begins with a quotation, and it reads as follows. Dr. Nico Smith, a Dutch reformed clergyman, quoted Hendrik Vervoet, apartheid prime minister, as saying that he wanted to implant the concept of apartheid so deeply into society that no future government would be able to undo what had been done. Whether Furwood's boast, as reported by Smith, will be realized if only in part remains to be seen. And the reason I open this talk and this book with that quotation is that it gives us a sense of the sheer monumental scale of the apartheid project and what this book endeavors to do perhaps quite provocatively is painfully reassess south africa three decades roughly after its constitutional passage and question the extent to which we have truly uprooted or even sought to uproot apartheid in all its dimensions and so in today's talk i'm going to do three things. First, I'll introduce the concept of the new apartheid and explain why I think it's important that we bring apartheid back into our discourse and our analysis as we understand and deconstruct South African society today. Then, I'll explore one of the chapters in the book that reflects on questions of wealth. And I'll try in that section 
to refract the conversation or reflect the conversation through a lens of Islamic thought on wealth. And then finally, in the conclusion and the final part of my talk, I'll reflect on how I conclude this work, calling for us to imagine a society beyond the limits of this one, and also try to reflect on how recent events in South Africa, whether we call it unrest, upheaval, or whatever we choose to term it, can be seen through some of the lenses of the new apartheid that I am trying to refract these social questions through. In other words, how do some of the upheavals that we've seen in all of our lives and in our country recently, how do they bear on my book and the idea of the new apartheid? So that's a roadmap and let me begin by starting with the concept of the new apartheid. And what I do in the book is I try to suggest that apartheid did not die. It was privatized. And so I'm trying to puncture this myth that lies at the center of our understanding of what it means to be South African right now, that in 1994, we vanquished apartheid, that we destroyed apartheid, and that the society that we rebuilt in its place represents something fundamentally new, a departure from the logic of apartheid. And I'm trying to contest that idea. I don't do so to disregard the important gains that were made in the constitutional moment, the construction of a new constitution, the conferral of voting rights to citizens above the age of 18, a massive political transformation. The question though is have we over-dramatized that transformation to the cost of appreciating the persistent and the constant presence of apartheid in the present? In other words, have we in our celebration glossed over the extent to which apartheid has taken on a new life in the new South Africa. And this life extends beyond the public sphere or beyond the sphere of state control or beyond the sphere of what the government does to us and extends into a private realm of life which is often beyond democratic control. And to what extent has apartheid adapted around the democratic constraints that were set for it in 1994? And how has it reinvented itself even as we celebrate its demise? And these are very difficult questions to confront. And one of the things that I realized in writing the book is firstly that we all have a very intimate relationship with apartheid. And therefore, conjuring the word, bringing the term up, makes us feel very uncomfortable. Especially for someone of a younger generation to bring up the word, who may not have directly experienced its most egregious evils. But I don't think a future historian, let's say someone a hundred years into the future looking back on our society today will fail to notice the resemblances between the past and the present. And so if deep down we know and we see and we feel that apartheid has not been defeated, then we shouldn't suppress the word if the word really does describe the intense injustices and inequalities and the deep desperation that we see around us. But in researching this book, I realized something quite terrifying. And that was that, particularly in the late 1980s, the apartheid project was reconceived for the future. 
And many apartheid planners, whether economists, politicians, academics, or theoreticians, began to realize that a democracy was inevitable. But they reasoned that even if we created a democracy, apartheid would be implanted so deeply into that democracy that the democracy would be incapable of overturning the momentum of apartheid. And how clearly we see some of those designs in our society today. Isn't it time that we reassessed this profound celebration in light of three decades of experience where our society has stagnated and failed to overturn the injustices and inequalities which persist along racial, gendered, classed, spatial grounds. And that's really the project of this book, is to resuscitate apartheid, to look at it once more, and to assess the extent to which we as a society have truly come to terms with it, and attempted to overturn it. And I show, or at least hope to show, that we have merely scratched the surface of apartheid as an edifice and as a system which is imprinted on the fabric of everyday life, even as it has become invisible. And so the irony is that apartheid since 1994 is at once all around us, but is at once unspoken and invisible. And so we need to render it visible again and speak its name again, that we might deconstruct it once and for all. The book tries to understand apartheid as a term, and it's actually a very complicated term when you think about how deeply it's been embedded. It's not just a question of separation. It's a question of intimate separation. Apartheid's planners, designers, as you know very well in your own life and I know very well in my life, constructed a system where we are intimately interconnected, unlike other systems of segregation. But at the same time as we are intimately interconnected, we are also worlds apart. The external borders of South Africa push us together, and so we rub shoulders every day with people across multiple divides. But we also never truly interact with them or commune with, with them. Or at least it's very difficult even in a democratic society. And so apartheid is about simultaneously squeezing people together while tearing them apart. And that's a very complex social, economic and political project that continues to be with us today. And so in the book what I do is I look at different aspects and dimensions of South African life and I look at the presence of apartheid in those different spheres and realms of our lived experience. So after the introduction I look at space, how we live, where we live and the continued segregation in our cities, in our rural areas, in townships, between townships, cities, and rural areas. And even in the private spheres within those places like gated communities, like malls, and like any place in South Africa where a private security guard is protecting an economic interest. There we see the new apartheid in all its complexity and horrifying force. I then turn to questions of law and I assess to what extent South Africa's democratic constitution is capable of surmounting the new apartheid. But the chapter that I want to look at which comes next is a chapter on wealth. And here I think we all often have heard this lament that wealth has remained largely the preserve of a minority 
in our country. And often that minority is racially coded. And so patterns of wealth distribution still by and large, despite some important exceptions, follow their apartheid predecessors. However, wealth has also changed form. But just because it's changed form since 1994 doesn't necessarily mean it's also changed hands. And so what I try to do in the book is show that wealth has gone overseas often. It has split up instead of one conglomerate controlling everything. That pool of wealth has broken into a hundred pieces and it has dispersed. And so in these changes of form, we often assume that there have been changes of ownership. But when you retrace wealth, whether it's overseas now or whether it's in new formations which have changed their shape since apartheid, when you trace them back to their ultimate owners, all the disparate pieces of the puzzle come together in a stark and a distressing picture of extreme wealth disparity and a monumental inability of our society to share wealth in a more equitable and just way. Particularly since much of that wealth was built on centuries and generations of dispossession, systematic, preconceived and passionately pursued dispossession. We have not begun to break the pattern that that dispossession set in train. And this brings me to questions of wealth as we conceive it in the Islamic tradition. Because all too often we hear of the virtues of wealth. And to be sure, Islam does not enjoin us to denounce wealth. But it does say many things through the Quran, through the Hadith, about the importance of pursuing wealth in a just way. And so wealth and justice are constantly juxtaposed or put together in conversations around the Islamic tradition. And striving for wealth is only legitimized and justified if such striving is done in the pursuit of a just cause, a just society and a just outcome. And so when we step back and look at our society and we look at the terrifying scale of the wealth that has been amassed for unjust purposes and through unjust intentions and with unjust means, then we don't just sit with a political problem. We sit with the problem that comes to the heart of teachings about justice and wealth in Islamic, in the Islamic tradition. And therefore, the new apartheid, apartheid was never just a political question for Muslims who strove to deconstruct apartheid, gave up their lives to fight apartheid. It was never simply a political question outside of the question of teachings of wealth and justice. It was a co question intimately connected to the very best of the Islamic tradition as it pertains to social equity. And therefore, if apartheid persists into 1994 and beyond, then so do the evils and the injustices which made apartheid possible. And therefore, the accumulation of wealth on a foundation as skewed as ours is in South Africa is a deeply complex ethical question. And it's one that I think we need to reflect on as a Muslim community in South Africa. Because to some extent, the accumula accumulation of wealth that we have been able to enjoy since 1994 has become integrated into a larger 
system of wealth which is based on an unjust premise. To be sure, many of us in the Muslim community since 1994 have accumulated wealth in order to lift our families out of poverty, out of struggle, to break the back of the apartheid oppression which has been thrust onto our families and generations before. And that's noble. However, when wealth accumulation becomes detached from its social purposes, then a danger arises. And that is that we wittingly or unwittingly, those of us who are lucky enough to enjoy wealth, wittingly or unwittingly can become integrated into apartheid forms of oppression through wealth accumulation. And therefore, this is not simply a question of whether it's good to be rich or not. It's a question of, in the context of South Africa today, three decades on from one of the most inhumane social systems ever created, what does it mean to accumulate wealth? And how do we use the wealth that may have been accumulated to destroy the system of apartheid that has made such inequity possible in the first place. And this brings me to concluding thoughts where I'd like to tie together some of what I've already said with questions of the future. Because if apartheid has truly been privatized, then it's no longer just the state that can address inequality in our society. If injustice itself has been privatized and pushed towards the private sphere in our private lives, in our private complexes, in our private bank accounts, and our private digital lives, then it can only be fought on the same grounds. And so I think we can all agree that if we wait for the South African government to overturn the new apartheid, we will be waiting for a very long time. But the truth of the matter is that the state simply is not capable or powerful enough. Even if we had the most benign, benevolent and far-sighted government, the state alone would not be capable of uprooting the new apartheid because its reach and its remit is so wide that no government can touch on so many different intimate parts of people's lives but rather in our own private spaces and in our own private sphere and as a community and as a Muslim community that has amassed wealth since 1994 that does have wealth to deploy into our society isn't it time we move beyond mere questions of welfare mere questions of preventing people from sliding into further and further poverty and started thinking about how we deploy the wealth that has been accumulated towards a fundamentally more just society, towards structural transformations in the way our cities are constructed, in the way land is distributed, in the way wealth is distributed in our society. Isn't it time that the wealth that exists in the Muslim community in South Africa is not just deployed to make us feel better or is deployed symbolically to serve actually our own egoistic, ritualistic performance, but is actually strategically deployed to attack the system of apartheid as it still continues to live and to break that system. And so I wonder whether if apartheid was privatized, so some of our solutions to this problem need to come from private actors as well as the state and whether we need to contest and confront the continuance of apartheid in the private world with a coordinated strategy of private actors who in a perfect world work in tandem with the state 
but in an imperfect world nonetheless take it upon themselves to use private wealth for public purposes. And so I think what we are called on to do in this particular moment in which we confront South Africa's inequalities is ask ourselves why is the so-called miracle in which we live so prone to disappoint us and we saw this disappointment most recently in the recent unrest slash upheavals in KZN and Gauteng. Now, we have all been very quick to dismiss this unrest as the premeditated plan of some narrow political elite or acts of pure criminality and opportunism. But when we really take a step back and ask ourselves why some of the acts of opportunism, to be sure, and even criminality, to be sure, why they were able to gain such popularity and encourage a sense of spontaneity in a kind of bizarre and chaotic uprising that focused on malls and areas of consumption. What we need to realize is that sometimes these malls are actually sites of political power. They're sites of the privatization of apartheid. They are guarded by private security guards they are sites of consumption for those who can afford it, but for those who can't, sites of longing, places where you can't enter easily unless you look a certain way or dress a certain way or come from a certain place. And so why was the rebellion in our society turned towards these centers of consumption? Well, I think part of the answer lies in what I've described in the new apartheid, in the way that our economy continues to lock out so many people who are locked out precisely because of apartheid's continued presence in our society. And so before we dismiss all that happened in our country just a few weeks ago, we would do well to ask ourselves why these sites of hyper consumption, big consumption, have become such a lightning rod for rebellion and why we have allowed such levels of desperation to persist. Having said that, the reason I bring these provocative questions before you, the reasons I probe at the new apartheid, are not to leave us in a sense of despair or even just to be merely provocative. Until we understand the scale of apartheid, of the project, and how the project continues to live even in a democracy, until we appreciate that scale, we can't begin to undo the new apartheid. And so from here, from this vantage point, three decades on, is it not time for us to reimagine what South Africa might be, what South Africa could be, outside of the narrow limitations which we have placed for ourselves or outside of the conceptions of justice which we happen to have inherited? And is it not time to consider not just a few new policies or even a change of government or a change in the way we all live our lives privately, but isn't it also time to consider an entirely new society. One that learns from and consolidates the gains made since 1994, but transcends the obvious failures which we see all around us, which have persisted despite our democratic order. 
And is it maybe not time to consider that we may be in a transitional place, a transitional state, a transitional republic? We have not yet extricated ourselves from apartheid, but we have begun to imagine a future beyond it. And isn't it time for us to seize that element of our society which transcends apartheid while we destroy that part of our society which reproduces apartheid? And so at the end of this book and at the end of this talk, I'd like to encourage us to reassess our long cherished and most deeply held assumptions about South African society and to question the wisdom even of our current constitutional order. Not to destroy that order or to replace it with something undemocratic or unconstitutional, but to suggest that we have not yet conceived of the most just way of organizing the country that we currently call South Africa. And that unless we summon the imagination, an imagination on the same scale as the imagination of the apartheid project itself, unless we summon the political imagination to transcend that monumental project and uproot it in all its forms across all spheres of our lives with simultaneous energy and intensity, then the vision of the apartheid project will always undermine our impoverished imagination. And so I think the time has come to start thinking about a wholly new republic and that what we're living in now would be the first democratic republic. And we need to start imagining the second democratic republic. The second democratic republic that transcends the first, consolidates its gains, but goes beyond them in a way that meaningfully affects the lives of those who continue to suffer under the yoke of the apartheid project. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you'll read the book and I hope you engage with the book and the work and I look forward to further engagements and I'm sure I join with you in looking forward to a time when we can be back together as a community at the Claremont Main Road Mosque. It's one that I visit whenever I come to Cape Town and I look forward to joining with you in prayer, in remembrance and in worship. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Imam Rashid, for the opportunity to address this community. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the dispenser of grace. Ya Rabbal Alameen, O Lord of the world and of everything that exists. We are grateful and thankful that you have blessed our country, South Africa, with rich human and natural resources. Ya Rabb al Maghfira, O Lord of forgiveness and mercy, we are deeply sorry and remorseful for the wrong use of all of your gifts and blessings through acts of injustice, corruption, violence, and looting. Ya Rabb al Rahma, O Lord of compassionate justice, at this difficult time, we make dua and we pray for those who have lost their lives and have been maimed as a result of the violence and looting. We pray and make dua for those whose property have been destroyed, vandalized and unjustly looted and stolen. May God console all of them and grant them the inspiration and ability to rise up once again and to rebuild 
their shattered lives. Ya Rabbal Mustad'afeen, O Lord of the oppressed and the marginalized, at this challenging time, we are mindful of the harm and the suffering that the violence and looting is inflicting on many people, most of all those who are hungry and lack the basic necessities to live a life of dignity and are unemployed and defenseless. Ya Rabba Shifa, O Lord of Healing, help us to heal our souls from greed and avarice, from racism and xenophobia. Heal our nation from the scourge of violence and corruption, racism and tribalism. Ya Rabba Rizq wa Khayr al-Raziqeen O Lord of Sustenance, one who is the best of providers, grant us the will and the capacity to use our country's resources for the well-being of all of its citizens. Ya Rabb al Quwa, O Lord of all power and awesome might, raise up for us just leaders who will respond to the violence, the looting and the corruption with wisdom and chivalry. And raise up for us selfless leaders who will lead our country to the ways of peace, prosperity and justice. And most of all, raise for us caring, active and responsible citizens who hold our elected leaders accountable for their political and moral mandates. نسألك بأسمائك الحسنى and we ask this through all of your holy and beautiful names رب الناس ورب العالمين Lord of all cultures and of all humankind اللهم آمين